So today we are going to talk about leukemia, Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. So when we think about cancer, cancer is actually a disease process that involves abnormal growth cell and differentiation. So it works is it works within the bone marrow oftentimes. And the bone marrow is the source of all blood cells. Our red blood cells, our white blood cells, and our platelets are all made in the bone marrow. And bone marrow also produces immature, undifferentiated cells called stem cells. These stem cells are pluripotent, which means that they can have more than one potential outcome. When these stem cells take on a specific pathway, it depends on what the body needs and the presence of different uh, specific chemicals that actually control their growth. Leukemia is the first type type of cancer we are going to cover and leukemia is actually occurs when there's an uncontrolled production of immature white blood cells or blast cells in the bone marrow. So when we think of immature white blood cells we also think of our bands and the shift to the left that we can see on diagnostic labs. But leukemia is this uncontrolled production of these immature cells that overcrowd and interfere with the production of our mature cells, which are our white blood cells, our red blood cells, and our platelets. And leukemia can be seen in different populations and different age ranges, but commonly we hear of leukemia spreading in the younger populations. So it can be acute or chronic. Acute leukemia has a sudden onset while chronic uh, persists over years. So these leukemic cells, when they are these immature white blood cells or blast cells, they interfere with our normal production of mature cells and also can spread into the different tissues. So into the reticuloendothelial tissues, such as our spleen, liver, and lymph nodes, and can cause some different signs and symptoms according to where they spread. The genetic risk is a very common cause or what leukemia has actually been linked to and the exact cause is unknown but it's shown that genetics have a damaging effect and so the damage to the genes controlling cell growth has been a, found to be a cause of leukemia as well as different environmental issues such as your HIV virus, your radiation and chemotherapy and different chemicals that can occur. I have a really good link at the bottom of this for you if you will check that out after um, you watch this PowerPoint presentation. But the blood cells in a leukemia patient look very different from those of a normal patient. If you look at the picture to the left, we have our normal plasma fluid that is running through our cells and we also have our normal white blood cells and our red blood cells and platelets. When we look at a leukemia patient on the right, we have our blast cells. And as you can see, they are very large. They are interfering with the normal movement of our white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets through the, our blood system. So the common symptoms of leukemia that we will monitor for as nurses can be kind of thought of in the different body systems. When we think of psychological changes, we think of fatigue, loss of appetite. Um, fatigue often is caused by the decreased red blood cell counts that are related to leukemia patients, and so you may see them be anemic and be very fatigued. Lymph nodes may be swollen in these patients. You may see spleen or liver enlargement, and that is caused from the cancerous leukemic cells invading the spleen and liver and causing that to enlarge. The skin may have some easy bleeding and bruising or purplish patches or spots and the patients may complain of night sweats as well. Systemic changes or symptoms of leukemia include weight loss, fever, frequent infections and these we can kind of refer to when we look at the white blood cell count and their immunosuppressed systems. So lungs you may see shortness of breath or basically when patients are walking and they may complain of worsened shortness of breath, uh, muscular weakness and pain and tenderness in the bones and joints may also be present. The signs and symptoms of leukemia continue on with cardiovascular changes and these are often related to our decreased red blood cell counts or anemia as well and those include hypotension, tachycardia, heart murmurs and heart palpitations. 
respiratory changes can also occur and those are usually related to infections and anemia so infections may be a bronchitis or a pneumonia that can infect these patients because they are immunosuppressed and you may notice increased respiratory rates shortness of breath coughing or abnormal or adventitious lung sounds such as wheezing crackles etc Skin changes can actually be due to the anemia or the decreased red blood cell counts as well. And those can include the petechiae, um, the bruising uh, can occur from the low platelet levels, and then infection, infected or open lesions may also occur, or pallor and coolness of the extremities. Continuing on with the clinical manifestations or signs and symptoms of leukemia patients, intestinal changes may occur, and these can be related to the increased bleeding tendency and fatigue. So you may see these patients have positive hemocult tests or occult blood in their stool. We may also see hypoactive bowel sounds, constipation, and we did talk about the enlargement of the liver and spleen that can occur. If you look at the picture to the right, we can actually see a normal sized spleen um, that is located kind of in that left upper quadrant um, underneath the ribs almost, and it, you can see the outline of how large the spleen can become once it's invaded with leukemic cells. Central nervous system changes include headache, palpedema, seizures, a coma, uh, these are all due to those leukemic cells actually invading the brain tissue and may even lead to a meningitis. Miscellaneous changes that can occur include bone and joint tenderness, um, swelling, and that is all from that bone marrow being damaged by the leukemic cells and those leukemic cells actually invading the bone marrow. Lymph node enlargement um, can also occur, and it's important to remember that infection is the number one cause of death in leukemia patients. So often that these patients are at risk for developing skin, respiratory, intestinal infections, um, and those are the most common places that they will develop infection, and it is the number one cause of death, so it's important to remember um, the precautions we need to take to prevent infection. Laboratory assessments with patients with leukemia are quite different. You may see we've talked about our platelet counts and how those may be low, and you may also see decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. Our white blood cell count is a little bit different and in every single patient. So white blood cell counts can be low, they can be normal, or they can even be elevated. Um, so you may see differences associated with the white blood cell counts, and that is in no way diagnostic of leukemia diagnosis. So bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, that is the definitive test for deciding whether or not a patient has leukemia. So we draw a biopsy, we do a bone marrow aspiration, and then we determine whether or not the leukemic cells are in that biopsy fluid. So when we take that biopsy, um, we will see the leukemic or blast phase cells, those immature cells, and we may also see antigens, which are protein markers that are present on the surface of leukemic cells. And those antigens actually help diagnose the type of leukemia, the stage of leukemia, and the prognosis. So it's important to kind of um, know that that bone marrow aspiration and biopsy are the definitive test for diagnosing leukemia. Blood clotting times can also be different, and you may see prolonged bleeding times or an increased risk of bleeding for these patients because they have reduced levels of fibrinogen or the clotting factors that we need to have in order to not um, profusely bleed. So you may see prolonged blood clotting times in these patients as well. And the imaging assessment are a little bit different on these patients. Um, Often chest x-rays are performed if a diagnosis of leukemia is considered and chest x-rays will help us determine whether or not leukemic infiltrates are present in the lungs. So if a client is having some cough, shortness of breath, and we are suspecting leukemia, we will often do a chest x-ray. Skeletal x-rays are also done and these help us to determine whether or not bone resorption is present. So in these leukemia patients, we may have a loss of bone minerals and density, and we need to do a skeletal x-ray to determine whether or not um, this is occurring.
spinal taps can also be done and I really like the picture that we have to the far right and that shows us a spinal tap and this is to actually assess for cerebral um, infiltration of leukemia cells and it, they actually do this in the brain and they can basically do a tap which helps us to determine where the leukemia cells are and if they are present in our cerebrospinal fluid and in the reservoir of the brain that we can draw from. So this we can actually insert um, intrathecal chemo through so the Omea reservoir is what you would look for and we can insert this intrathecal chemo through that area in order to treat leukemia. Bone mar marrow aspirations, as we talked about, are what actually we use to diagnose leukemia. And it gives us the number of blaster stem cells or leukemic cells within the bone marrow. And we are also IDing the type of white blood cell involvement and the stage of its involvement or development. So the bone marrow aspirations are definitive. They tell us the stage of the development of leukemia. If 25% of the cells are stem or blast cells, leukemia is confirmed in patients, and that is important to know, and then we can go on and figure out the stage of that development from the bone marrow aspiration. In adults only, the sternum, tibia, or vertebrae may be used, but most commonly, the posterior iliac crest is used. And the picture on the previous slide did show that posterior iliac crest being accessed for the bone marrow aspiration. In children, those sites are actually contraindicated, and they prefer to use long bones, such as the femur. We also want to, as nurses, inform our patients of a procedure, have them sign a consent, and we need to actually give them information on how the procedure is going to go in a step-by-step -step form and how to monitor themselves afterwards. So after the procedure, um, we need to tell them that they need to cover the site with a band-aid, check it for bleeding. Um, these patients are usually in the hospital and we can monitor these things, so it's important to know that if we do see bleeding on that site, we may need to put a sandbag on it to provide pressure and stop the bleeding. Also, a bone marrow aspiration is quite uncomfortable. There is pain involved, and so it's important to provide pain management for these patients. They are going to be awake and they are going to maybe have just a minor mild sedation and so it's important to notify them they may feel some pain but we can provide some pain management for this. Uh, there will be no aspirin used and obviously with bone marrow aspirations and leukemia patients with decreased platelet levels we do not want to thin their blood anymore by using aspirin or any anticoagulant. This is a picture of a bone marrow aspiration and it gives you a nice view of how patients can lie when this is being done and it gives you a view of your posterior iliac crest. You know, some of these patients can lay on their right or left sides and get as comfortable as they can be. And then it shows you also that the needle is going through that skin, through the cortical bone, and then into the spongy bone and into the bone marrow. And that is where we are drawing our bone marrow specimen from. And when they look at these under a microscope, you can see the differences between normal bone marrow appearance and bone marrow with leukemic cells. The leukemic cells look much larger. Um, they are just very differenti differentiated and from a normal bone marrow appearance. So the different interventions that we want for these patients um, is that we want to prevent infection. Infection is the major cause of death in patients with leukemia. And as we know and talked about in our previous PowerPoints, sepsis is a complication that is common among patients that develop cancer and develop infections. So infection can occur through several different means. Auto contamination of which the normal flora of our system, our own system, can overgrow and contaminate so that we are at a risk for infection with leukemia patients because of that. Cross-contamination can also occur is what when, hap when this happens, um, another person or something from the environment, let's say a patient with uh, flu or influenza comes in and they are exposed to these patients, um, they may cross-contaminate and we may have um, this infection also in our leukemia patients. 
So the drug therapies that we actually use can be what actually contributes to our risk for infections. Um, drug therapy that is used in leukemia patients includes chemotherapeutic combinations and induction therapies. So induction therapies are intense combinations of chemo started right at the time of diagnosis and the goal is to re achieve rapid complete remission. While chemotherapeutic combinations are um, a drug that's used for maybe a couple of days and then they try another drug for a couple of days. Um, one of the examples that I provided here is the 7 plus 3 regimen and it's IV cytosine times 7 days with Danny, Danny Robeson for 3 days. So it is kind of a combination drug uh, method. But together these chemotherapeutic combinations can actually cause severe bone marrow suppression which, as we know, puts patient, patients at risk for pancytopenia, which is our decreased white blood cells, decreased red blood cells, and decreased platelets. So your severe bone marrow suppression can put these patients at risk for infection and at risk for death. Nausea and vomiting may also occur as side effects from this drug therapy, diarrhea, alopecia, stomatis, and kidney and cardiac and liver toxicities as well. Further drug therapy that is used if patients actually do develop an infection um, can be antibiotics, antifungals, or antiviral drugs. And it's important to remember that antibiotics are often given as broad spectrum antibiotics. So your aminoglycosides, your penicillins, or your third generation cephalosporins may be used in these patients. And vancomycin may also be used um, to help prevent um, MRSA in patients or in patients that already have MRSA until we figure out what that infection actually is and what drugs are sensitive to that. Antifungals include nizorol, fluconazole or diflucan, nystatin or mycostatin, and amphotericin B. And antifungals are used especially in the patients that have arcaniasis or the yeast infection of um, any area really but we want to use these antifungals to help prevent um, that infection from occurring. Antiviral drugs are used to treat viral infections. So if a patient develops some type of viral infection, let's say HIV AIDS, we would treat them with antiviral drugs. So acyclovir, gancyclovir, um, steroids, those are types of antiviral drugs, your gancyclovir and acyclovir and they actually can cause ototoxicity um, and nephrotoxicity. So it's important to remember those side, side effects that can occur from your antiviral drugs. And we discussed antivirals a lot when we um, discussed your HIV and AIDS unit. So refer to that PowerPoint for more information on your antivirals. So with leukemia, um, we have kind of discussed how to treat the different risk so the patients are at risk for infection we would want to treat them with something um, to help cure that infection however the general leukemia treatment is a bone marrow transplant or a hema hematopoietic stem cell transplant it's the standard treatment if the patient has a closely matched donor and is in temporary remission so when we think of these leukemia patients, this is what they want to have done so that they can be cured and that they can have their total body irradiated of all the bone marrow that is affected with the leukemic cells with healthy bone marrow. So I like the picture to the right because it tells us the types of stem cell transplants and it's very nice to kind of look at a picture. If you think of an allogenic family member or an unrelated donor, um, that is to the left and then the autologous donor is your self donation in which you use your own stem cells collected before um, hand and before the high dose therapy has been initiated and then you're ha you have your syngenic or your identical twin so it's a, an identical match um, it's an HLA match which is a human, leu human leukocyte antigen match from a relative or from a matched donor and we do know that stem cells themselves can be transplanted from um, or obtained from bone marrow harvest from individuals who are willing to donate bone marrow from peripheral stem cell phoresis in which they take the bone marrow and 
also from umbilical cord blood stem cell banking. So we can take the blood um, cord blood from umbilical cords and use that the stem cells from that for these bone marrow transplants. I really like this slide because it gives you a good picture of how bone marrow transplantation timing and steps work. So if we think about a patient who is coming in with leukemia and needs a bone, a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell, cell transplant, they initially come in approximately six days before the actual transplant occurs. And during this time, they undergo a conditioning regimen in which we wipe out the body's own bone marrow and give it higher than normal doses of chemo and radiation to rid that person of all the cancer cells. So uh, during those initial five to ten days, um, that chemo and radiation and a wiping out of the body's own um, infected bone marrow. Then around day zero, after all of the leukemic cells have been wiped out, the patient receives the stem cells. And this is marrow that's transfused similar to a blood transfusion with similar side effects. And we want to treat those side effects. So if you think of your potential side effects of a blood, blood transfusion, we think of our fever, our rash, um, those very common side effects, itchiness, and we want to just treat those. Um, treat nausea, treat vomiting, treat the pain, um, possible anemia can occur with bone, bone marrow transplants or infections. So we need to treat all of those things. During the next period um, of time from day zero to about day 14 is when we may have to give these patients continuous nausea and pain management, fluid and electrolyte, electrolyte management, so we may need to replace some potassium, we need to, may need to give them IV fluids, um, blood product support if they need platelets, if they need um, packed red blood cells, antibiotic treatment, and graft versus host disease, which we will talk about on the next couple slides, prophylaxis. So these patients may also need TPN or CB, CVN, total parental nutrition or central venous nutrition to help aid in that healing process. So by day 14, we think of engraftment or the successful take of the transplanted cells in the patient's bone marrow. And that is actually the key to this whole process. So we go through the conditioning regimen, we go through the transplant, and this engraftment is what we need to have happen. It usually takes 8 to 12 days for peripheral blood stem cell transplants and 12 to 28 days for bone marrow stem cell transplants. And we may see um, increased white blood cells, increased red blood cells, and increased platelet counts. And that is a good thing. These leukemia patients often have those lower levels of white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, and they are pancytopenic, and we, if we see increases in these, that is a great thing. Um, if the transplanted cells fail to engraft, the patient will die unless another transplant with stem cells is successful. So they will need another stem cell transplant. If the engraftment is successful and that take of the transplanted bone marrow is successful, then the patient is usually discharged around day 35. So it seems like a long process, and it is, and these patients are hospitalized and treated very seriously during this time. So graft-versus-host disease is something that can happen when a stem cell transplant is being done. And what graft-versus-host disease is, is when immunocompetent cells of the donated bone marrow recognize the patient's cells and tissues as foreign, and they are going to start an attack on them. And basically, um, they will attack all tissue, um, they can damage the skin, the int intestinal tract, and the liver, and it can occur in almost 25 to 50 percent of our allogenic transplants. Um, the mortality rate with graft-versus-host disease is very high, and it, they say almost 15 percent of people that develop this do die. Um, the graft cells in this disease basically are trying to attack the host cells and tissues, um, so your killer cells attack the HLL, uh, HLA cells. How we can manage this graft-versus-host disease is by suppressing the immune function and activity of donor T cells using drugs. So what is commonly used to suppress this is cyclosporine, methotrexate, or corticosteroids. Um, cell sept can be used, and tracheolimus may be used as well. 
I do have a video here for you um, about Hodgkin's lymphoma and it basically goes over um, Hodgkin's lymphoma and I would like you to watch that video um, prior to viewing the rest of the PowerPoint so if you can put that link in and watch the video it's a very good introduction to Hodgkin's so Hodgkin's lymphoma starts in a single lymph node or a single chain of lymph nodes and it is characterized by the special special cancer cell marker that is present in Hodgkin's lymphoma the Reed Sternberg cell is this special cancer cell and there are other defining um, characteristics that are associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I really like the picture up to your right because it shows this large rubbery fixed to the adjacent tissue lymph node. These are usually present in the neck and become painful when alcohol is ingested. Um, Hodgkin's lymphoma primarily occurs in teens and young adults and adults in their 50s and 60s. So if we think of these hard, um, rubbery, fixed uh, lymph nodes, if we are noticing these in anyone of that age group, we maybe need to go get them tested. And other signs and symptoms that can be experienced or are defining of this Hodgkin's lymphoma, lymphoma include fever, chills, drenching night sweats, and unexplained weight loss. Uh, I actually had a an individual that I played college basketball with and she developed Hodgkin's lymphoma and her characteristic defining um, signs and symptoms were exactly the same as these. She had fevers, tr chills, drenching night sweats, unexplained weight loss. Um, for the For a period of time she actually felt as if she had the flu and so it's important to remember those defining characteristics and know that that if you do see a lymph node that is enlarged greater than a centimeter rubbery fixed to tissue and usually painless um, or painful when alcohol is ingested um, that it may be Hodgkin's lymphoma and some tests should be drawn and a physician should be seen so the diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma is also the bone marrow biopsy. That is the definitive diagnosis and it will reveal a presence of the Reed Sternberg cell. If you look at the picture to the right, you can see a normal lymphocyte cell um, that is seen on a microscope and then you can see the Reed Sternberg cell and the very um, defining, I guess, characteristics of that cell. There are different stages um, or staging with Hodgkin's lymphoma and the diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma is a little bit different as well. So the staging, um, they may de define Hodgkin's lymphoma as an A status Hodgkin's lymphoma, which means it's without any other symptoms. Or they de may define it as a B status lymphoma, which means that symptoms are present. And those symptoms that we think of are the large fixed lymph nodes, the fever, the night chill, the chills, the night sweats, unexplained weight loss. So those are the um, common diagnostic signs and symptoms that we will see with B status lymphoma. Um, diagnosis, what they do to diagnose Hodgkin's lymphoma is usually the bone marrow biopsy to define that Reed Sternberg cell. Um, CTs are often done to help identify the spread and the stage of the disease and actually PET scans as well. So what my, um, my friend that I know uh, actually did was have a CT done and there was actually the presence of the Reed Sternberg cell when she did her biopsy eventually but there was also a presence of these small tumors um, on her near her heart and uh, near her lymph nodes so that is where they saw and CTs are often done and PET scans are often done to help identify that spread in that stage of the disease. Lymph node biopsies may also be done in lymphangiograms or um, the pro procedure that is done um, is when a dye is injected into the IV and the whole lymphatic system can actually be vis visualized because then those lymph nodes, um, you can see the tumors on those lymph nodes. So we have, tumor, or we have lymph nodes all over our bodies and the lymphangiogram can basically light all of those up so that we can determine where um, this possible Hodgkin's lymphoma is. 
the Hodgkin's lymphoma staging is different than non-Hodgkin's lymphoma staging. So I want to point this out because I want you guys to see exactly where. So if you think of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, we know that there are different stages, the A are asymptomatic and B, the unexplained weight loss, all those signs and symptoms, the symptomatic. Um, in stage one, there's only a single lymph node region or single extra lymphatic site that is affected. So if you think of your lymph nodes, um, this they can be in any area, but there is only a single one affected in stage one. Stage two is actually what um, my friend had. She had one in her um, cervical lymph node and also a lymph node around the heart area. And so two or more sites uh, should be on the same side of the diaphragm or with a contiguous contiguous extra lymphatic site. So that is stage two. Stage three are on both sides of the diaphragm or with the spleen involvement or contiguous extra lymphatic sites. And then stage four is diffuse involvement of extra lymphatic sites plus a nodal disease. Okay, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, as nurses, we want to be able to treat um, these disease processes, these cancers. And Hodgkin's lymphoma, fortunately, is one of the most treatable types of cancer. And I am extremely happy to say that the friend that I have been referring to is now free of cancer. She underwent chemotherapy, radiation, um, for a period of time and is now um, free of cancer and is actually pregnant. So it is a great thing and it can be treatable. So diagnosing um, those definitive characteristics or signs or symptoms early on is important in these patients. External radiation can be done um, for patients that have Hodgkin's lymphoma in stages one and stages two. Um, chemotherapy can also be done in, in these patients to help treat um, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And oftentimes, combination radiation and multiple chemotherapy drugs are given it to achieve a synergistic effect, which is a stronger effective um, treatment when medications or treatments are given together. So that's a synergistic effect. Um, nursing interventions that are common for these types of patients are to monitor for any of those signs and symptoms or problems that we may experience with chemotherapy side effects and radiation side effects. So we talked about those in depth on the cancer slides and you need to refer to those to kind of determine how you're going to treat these patients. So if they're having skin problems, um, radiation burns, any breakdown from radiation, we need to help treat those. Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, we need to treat the side effects of that as well. And then drug-induced pancytopenia. Pancytopenia refers to decreased Red, red blood cells, decreased white blood cells, and de decreased platelets. And we know if a patient is pancytopenic, they are at increased risk for infection. And usually this is a drug-induced effect and usually from chemotherapy um, agents. These patients may also have liver function impairment, um, and that usually is from the chemotherapy, and we do know that um, radiation can cause permanent sterility and possibly secondary cancer development down the, long, down the road. I also want you to refer to this video on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. All of these videos are actually accessed from the Cancer Center, um, cancercentersofamerica.com, and so if you go to these, you can find very useful videos um, that will kind of give you an overview of these diagnoses. So um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is actually, um, there are more than 60 types of this disease process and all lymphoid cancers, so all cancers that affect the lymphatic system that do not have the Reed-Sternberg cell are referred to as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, it spreads in a less orderly fashion through the lymph nodes and it's more common in men and older adults versus our younger population in Hodgkin's lymphoma. The stage is based on lymph node involvement, and I do want you to refer to your Iggy book, Table 42.3, in order to um, kind of determine these stages. They differ from the Hodgkin stages, and there's also a diagram that we are going to go through on the next slide here that will help you visualize the different stages that occur in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Painless swollen lymph nodes in the axillary, inguinal, femoral, or cervical areas um, can be present in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
The treatment always depends on the stage of the disease, the subtype of the tumor, the tumor burden, prognosis, or other health problems. So when we think of stage one adult non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we think of how the lymph node is affected and what lymph nodes are affected. So we see the diaphragm is pointed out in these and that is a very important thing to kind of remember where the diaphragm is at and where um, our lymphatic system is. So there are all sorts of lymphoid tissue or um, lymph nodes in our system and you can see the one that's pointed out in the picture to the left is the cervical lymph nodes. So that's kind of in the lymph vessels are affected and that is kind of his cervical lymph node and only one single lymph node region is affected. So it's your lymph nodes, your tonsils, your thymus, your spleen, only one single lymph node in that region is um, defi definitive of stage one non-Hodgkin's. Stage two non-Hodgkin's is a little bit different and stage two actually involves two or more separate lymph node regions on the same side of the diaphragm. So in this picture we can see the cervical and the axillary are both affected and so two or more of these separate lymph node regions, so you have your cervical region and your axillary region are present and then we also have this above the diaphragm. So that is considered stage two. If it would be below the diaphragm, as in these bottom um, ones, you can have your inguinal um, lymph nodes present there and we can have both of those actually below. So as you can see, there are a ton of lymph nodes throughout our body and as long as um, cancer is on two or more separate lymph node regions above um, or below the diaphragm, but they have to be on the same side, that is definitive of stage two adult non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Multiple myeloma is actually a white blood cell can cancer that involves a more mature lymphocyte called a plasma cell. So overgrowth of B lymphocyte plasma cells in the bone marrow is definitive of multiple myeloma. These plasma cells actually overproduce antibodies and overproduce the cytokines that normally destroy the bone and produce abnormal and excessive amounts of immunoglobulins. So when immunoglobulins, such as our IgG, IgA, um, when they are overproduced, there are fewer functional white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. So we don't have those produced, we have these immunoglobulins and a, a overgrowth of B lymphocyte plasma cells. This can lead to anemia, an increased risk of infection, and increased bleeding. And multiple myeloma, unfortunately, can invade lymph nodes, can invade the liver, the spleen, your kidneys, and cause very progressive bone destruction as well. And doing an assessment as a nurse for patients with multiple myeloma is a very important role that we take on. So if a patient comes into an oncology clinic or into an acute care setting and you are working in, on, in an oncology floor and they start complaining of some pain, that is a very serious thing and we need to be able to treat that pain in some way. Um, usually pain medications are ordered and we will talk more about those interventions later on, but our assessment we may see that skeletal pain and they may complain of the pelvis, spine, and rib pain. Um, some patients are unable to walk because the pain is so severe or they develop these small bone fractures due to the multiple myeloma. I really like the picture on the right here because it just shows the vertebral destruction and collapse um, with spinal cord compression and it shows how um, the multiple myeloma causes basically holes within the spinal cord spaces and that is where we are seeing um, that vertebral destruction. Hypercalcemia is also present in these patients because our calcium is leaving our bones and entering our bloodstream um, as in all cancers that have hypercalcemia associated and hyperuricemia or uric acid in the blood is also associated with these patients. So uh, sometimes they may be treated with our allopurinol to prevent any renal calculi from forming um, and also we monitor these patients from for renal failure because of the uric acid that is kind of developing in their system. They may develop some renal failure complications. 
Anemia, thrombocytopenia can also occur in these patients and that is due to replacement of the normal blown marrow by the plasma cells. So as we know that plasma cell is taking over the system and we're not developing our white blood cells, our platelets, our, our red blood cells and that can lead to our pancytopenia. The diagnosis of multiple myeloma is very um, definitive. So when we think of a bone marrow biopsy, we know that it has been the definitive diagnosis and has shown a trend in all of our leukemias, our uh, multiple myeloma. So we want to do a bone marrow biopsy on this patient and as a definitive diagnosis. And that actually shows us the number of um, increased plasma cells in the system. We also can do a urine test on these patients and a Benz Jones protein is what they are actually testing for and we will see that present in patients that have multiple myeloma and you can um, usually think of that as another one of those diagnoses that are seen but your definitive diagnosis is your biopsy. X-rays may also be done and those show some bone thinning. Um, the x-ray to the right, you can see it almost resembles the Swiss cheese that I refer to in the PowerPoint, but that is characteristic of multiple myeloma. And then high immunoglobulin levels. Um, we are going to be re putting antibodies that are in the blood, so your IgA, IgG, IgD, they may be testing for those, um, as well as serum proteins um, that can be produced by the malignant cells of multiple myeloma. I like this chart because I think it gives us a very good idea of the effects of increased myeloma cells in bone marrow and what um, we want to watch for as nurses and the impact on our patients. So obviously multiple myeloma, we have talked about how patients can have anemia or decreased red blood cells and that is due to um, the decrease in the number and activity of red blood producing cells because we know that those plasma cells are taking over versus our white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. And the impact that that can have on patients is pretty severe. They can be very fatigued. They can experience some weakness. Uh, they can also experience some hypotension if their red blood cells are very low or oxygen difficulties because we know red blood cells carry oxygen. Our high protein level in the blood and in the urine um, is produced are caused by abnormal or monoclonal proteins that are produced in multiple myeloma cells and released into the bloodstream. And we do know that the protein that is in our urine is that Benz Jones protein. So the high protein level in the blood and in the urine can lead to sluggish circulation. We may have decreased peripheral pulses and we can lead to possible kidney damage. So we need to monitor for renal failure or uric acid levels, possibly treat those high uric acid levels um, to prevent any renal calculi from forming. Bone damage may also occur in multiple myeloma and we talked about how the x-rays look almost like uh, Swiss cheese and so that is due to the thinning and the areas of lesions and fractures um, and severe damage or osteoporosis to the patients. Um, the mul multiple myeloma cells actually activate osteoclast cells which destroy the bone and they block osteo osteoblast cells which are normally repair damaged bones so um, they work together and bone damage and bone pain is extremely prevalent in the multiple myeloma patients and extremely important to treat that and we will talk about the interventions for treating pain on one of the next slides here. But bone pain, bone swelling, um, fractures or collapse of the bone are all present due to this, um, the multiple myeloma cells actually activating osteoclast cells and blocking osteoblast cells. High blood calcium levels or hypercalcemia may also occur and that is because the calcium is released from the damaged bone into the bloodstream and that can lead to those signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia. So your dehydration, your constipation, your fatigue, weakness, um, mental confusion. And then on to the next um, one here, we reduced normal func immune function against infection and we talked about that already with how um, the myeloma cells actually block the production of normal white blood cells or antibodies um, against infection. So their immune system is extremely immunosuppressed and they are susceptible to a lot of infection. 
Unfortunately, there is no cure for multiple myeloma. Um, I have known an individual with multiple myeloma and several, several clinical trials had been have been tried. Um, that is another option for these patients. Clinical trials, um, as we watched in that video, are something that are commonly used, especially in very prevalent hospitals that have researchers that are constantly looking at new ways or new cures for cancers. So currently there is no cure for multiple myeloma and death usually occurs within two to five years. Um, and that usually is due to infection or from renal failure. So because their immunosystems are so suppressed, we may have death from just sepsis or infection, a severe infection. Um, chemotherapy is the standard treatment and stem cell transplants can also be done. Um, we want to always provide analgesics for these patients. Um, severe bone pain does occur in multiple myeloma and it's important to know that how to manage that bone pain. And actually just recently we talked about um, in a meeting with a Veraquina piece here that a new genetic testing is going to be done that will determine how the body will react to different pain medications and will determine what will be the best pain management for those patients. So that's very exciting that a hospital near us is getting to do that genetic testing and they are going to start with their patients with knees and hips and uh, elective surgeries and hopefully that genetic testing will uh, maybe someday be used in patients with multiple myeloma and help them with proper pain management and what to use. Um, it's important to remember too that with pain management we want these patients on schedules of pain management and in between those schedules we may be giving them something um, for the breakthrough pain because they can it may seem like they've developed almost a I don't know if you've ever heard people say that they develop a resistance to pain medication or a tolerance to pain medication but um, proper pain management we would think, you know, we need to give these patients something more. And so giving them something more is often referred to as um, the breakthrough pain and it, we can also use alternative approaches for pain management such as relaxation, aromatherapy, hypnosis, um, and we actually do also initiate biophosphonate medications such as pamadronate, um, abadronate and these medications are biophosphonates actually work to stop the bone resorption and help reduce any skeletal complications that can occur. So what are the nursing interventions for patients receiving cancer therapy? And we have kind of covered these but I want to go over them again because they are important and we need to know them. So preventing infection is the main thing that we need to know. We want to check our vital signs at least every four hours and if they are running a temperature we know that temperature indicates infection so an elevated temperature we need to report to physicians especially if it's greater than 101 degrees um, monitoring white blood cells and initiating reverse isolation for a white blood cell count less than a thousand is usually initiated so those neutropenic precautions are what we need to watch and reverse isolation is sometimes done for these patients to help prevent any more infection from being introduced to their rooms um, inspecting all ports of entry for signs and symptoms of infection including your IV sites, your central line insertion sites, your arterial lines, your Foley catheters. Uh, we need to watch all of the ports of entry for any signs and symptoms of infection and report those immediately. Avoiding fresh fruits, uh, raw meat, and fresh, fresh vegetables are always done with these patients because they can introduce bacteria into the body and we can, they can be present on the fruits and vegetables and raw meat, so it's important to avoid all of those things. Fresh flowers are also removed from patients' rooms that are neutropenic or need reverse isolation due to low white blood cell counts, and that is because there's organisms on fresh flowers that could cause infection for these patients. Turn coughing and deep breathing every two hours is usually done to prevent any pneumonia from forming in these patients and avoiding contact with persons who are having infections or wearing masks when we're taking these patients out of the room and protecting them from anyone else that is around that could be introducing infection to them. 
a risk for injury is also very serious in cancer patients and this is due to a decreased platelet count. Um, a platelet count we know at normal is between 150,000 to 450,000 and less than 50,000 puts a patient at extreme risk for bleeding. Um, if a patient is less than 20,000 they are at risk for spontaneous bleeding. So it's important to monitor them for any Thing that would possibly cause injury to them or internal bleeding. If they're being hit by something or moved very roughly, um, it's important to think of that injury factor associated with low platelet counts. We also want, want to monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding, um, oozing, petechiae, um, purpura, any bl blood in the stools, any blood in the urine, uh, any blood in their vomit at all. So we want to watch for those signs and symptoms of internal bleeding or external bleeding. And we want these patients to use soft toothbrushes and electric razors. They should not be using shavers that have sharp blades on them if their platelet counts are very low because they could bleed and they could bleed for a long time. So using um, normal saline mouthwash and no very harsh commercial mouthwashes um, is important. We want these patients who have sores in their mouth to have those sores remain intact and not bleed. Avoiding rectal temps and rectal and IM routes of medications is important as well because we can puncture some of the soft tissues with rectal temperatures or rectal medications even and um, we want to not do IM routes of medications because that would be invasive. Um, avoiding catheterization if possible because we could um, injure the tissues, you know, sometimes catheter insertions are quite rough and so that can cause blood in the urine and these patients, if they have any tissue injury, can bleed for a long time if their platelet counts are so low. Um, an intake of fluids up to three liters per day is usually important for these patients to maintain adequate fluid intake, stool softeners um, to make sure that they are not straining um, in order to have a bowel movement, and then we know the treatment for low platelets is new mega. so if you guys review that from the prior slide as well. And then avoiding aspirin and SEDS as those can be, um, aspirin can increase our risk for bleeding as well. Nutrition for these patients is very important. Cancer patients are often do not have a very good appetite and they need promotion of nutrition, whether that is from a dietitian or from you as the nurse. So high calories, carbs and proteins, small frequent meals when they are hungry, um, give them whatever they want, usually um, prevent unpleasant sights, odors, sounds. So oftentimes cold food is more tolerable than hot food because hot food smells a little bit stronger and can um, be very unpleasant for these patients that are already slightly nauseous whether that be from chemotherapy treatments or radiation, um, ensuring adequate fluid intake, preventing um, any poor oral hygiene habits, so using those soft toothbrushes, um, washing the mouth, and making sure that the teeth are brushed to prevent any bacteria, and then ensuring adequate pain relief, distracting them, um, relaxation, guided imagery. As I talked about, give pain medications on a schedule and give them something for breakthrough pain. They will need it. And then controlling nausea with medications. Um, some frequent medications that we use for nausea are Zofran, Reglan. Um, we can also use Compazine that is given oftentimes for nausea as well. And Maintaining um, or helping these patients with fatigue and we know that anemia or decreased red blood cells leads to fatigue and unfortunately in leukemia these patients have high rates of metabolism and they can become very very exhausted. Um, we also know that patients that are undergoing chemotherapy and radiation can become very exhausted from the routine of it um, and from the medications themselves can cause drowsiness and so sometimes these patients may need blood transfusions because of decreased hemoglobins or hematocrits and so we give them packed red blood cells and we also can give them drug therapy such as epigen, procrit, or aranesp and those are given for our patients that have our stimulate the red blood or the bone marrow to make red blood cells I'm sorry and side effects of 
epigen or procrit can include hypertension, headache, fever, muscle aches, rashes, so it's important to remember those as well when we're trying to manage fatigue for these patients. Energy management is very important for all cancer patients. Limiting the number of visitors if they are feeling very fatigued and exhausted, giving them frequent rest periods, but planning activity for them. So giving them um, a schedule to help them conserve the energy and then exercise because that will actually increase their um, level of fatigue and they will actually feel better if they have frequent rest periods and planned activity. Impaired skin integrity is something to consider in the cancer care of patients because of the diarrhea, the mucositis, the erythema, edema, and desquamation that can occur from the medications and from the cancers in general. So as you can see in this picture, his skin is basically flaking off or desquamating and we want for these patients to basically avoid rubbing and scratching, avoid exposing the open skin to any cold weather or any bright sunlight, avoiding tight clothing for these patients, and using very lukewarm water if we're giving them baths, not giving them a bath that's very cold or very hot, no extremes, and avoiding any harsh perfumed soaps, avoiding deodorants and any skin irritants that would be worsening um, the appearance of the skin integrity. One of the last things that I want to talk about are the stages of death and coping. So what we talk about here is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And denial is when a patient first finds out that they, or a family member, has found out that they have cancer. And they may be in shock, they may be in disbelief, and they may just kind of deny the situation altogether. The next stage of death or coping that patients often go through is anger. And if anyone has ever um, had a family member or a friend that has had cancer, I think this goes through everyone's mind and it is a very hard stage to go through because we want to blame others, we want to ask why, and often these patients are very angry and upset with the fact that they are the ones that are dealing with cancer. Bargaining is one of the next phases that are stages of death and coping that patients go through. And this is that stage where they say, well, if I do this, will you please cure me of the cancer? Well, if I do this, and they often bargain with God. And it seems like um, that this bargaining phase is also another just desperate attempt um, in the stage of death and coping. Depression is one of the next stages, and this is when these patients often feel hopeless, um, weeping, they are very quiet and withdrawn, and they kind of have not accepted, but they have basically determined that, you know, this is going to probably be the end of their life, and they have become very depressed over it, and family members may go through these phases, and the patients certainly go through these phases and acceptance is one of the last phases that actually hits them and this phase seems to be the most difficult to reach for every patient and some patients may not reach it at all so when we think of these stages of death and coping as a nurse it's important that we consider using chaplaincy using social services um, speaking with the patients ourselves and using therapeutic communication because the stages of death and coping that they go through are all different and every patient's different and every family member's different and considering all the options is what we need to do in order to treat the patient as a whole. So this is a little mnemonic for you guys to use. Um, it says cancer and it is related to basically what we need to do for these patients. So comfort, um, consider altered body images that may occur from the loss of hair or impaired skin integrity or sores on their mouth, um, our skin, and then nutrition. Uh, that's an important role in cancer therapy and so we want to manage their nutrition very well. Uh, chemotherapy, we need to consider the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation and how to treat those and then evaluating the response to medications. And as we talked about 
Usually these patients need to be on medications that cause some type of a side effect and evaluating their response to medications and the side effects that can occur and being able to treat those side effects is what we need to do in order to treat the patient as a whole. And then respite for caretakers. Uh, if we have a family member who has a patient that they have been taking care of at home, it can get very overwhelming for them and involving social services and determining whether these patients should possibly um, have some help at home, whether it be through home health or outpatient services. Um, respite for caretakers is very important. Okay, we will go over the last um, PowerPoint clickers that we have for leukemia and lymphoma and I will give you the answers to those. So the answer to this one is for biopsy of the tumor. The answer to number two is two, forcing fluids. The answer to number three is occurs most often in older adults or three. The answer to number four is four or increased uric acid levels. The answer to number five is three, or applying pressure on the irritated area to prevent bleeding. The answer to number six is two, do not allow pregnant women into the client's room. And the answer to this is number four, enlarged lymph nodes. The answer to this question would be two, bargaining. And the answer to our last clicker question is two, prevent hyperuricemia.